Hi, everyone. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, um, depending on where and when you're zooming in from. I'd really like to warmly welcome you to the second event of Dance Art Foundation's series, Organizing for Change. Um, today, we're using live closed captioning, which is generated automatically, and apologies in advance for any mistakes that might occur with this technology because it is automated. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing myself to you. My name is Amara Rahim, and I'm a choreographer and a performer, a writer and a researcher. And I'm dialing in from a place in Victoria, a little known place in Victoria, Australia called the Black Range. Um, this is contested country. Um, the traditional owners are the Jaburong or the Jaja Wajali people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and I pay my deep respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And if there's any First Nations people who are joining us tonight, um, a, a, a warm welcome to you. Um, the resilience and survival strategies of First Nation people all over the globe is um, really remarkable and we have a lot to learn from them. My own history is one of migration. I was born in Sri Lanka, I grew up in Melbourne and I lived in London for 15 years. Um, that's where I met Jo Moran, who is amongst many things, the artistic director of the Dance Art Foundation and co-curator of this series. Um, I have a whole community of creative practitioners that I feel very connected to in the UK. And one of the best things about COVID-19 for me has been that um, as many projects pivoted online, I was invited to, partic to participate in a whole number of processes because um, we just don't rely on being in place in the ways that we once used to. So I was very honored and grateful and motivated to co-curate Organizing for Change series with Joe. It's been a huge learning curve. It's also been a real pleasure to work with Joe and Dance Art Foundation. And um, it's been also really great to have the opportunity to think inside as well as outside of London um, to other parts of the world so that a different set of networks might come into play um, and different kinds of practitioners and thinkers might encounter each other like tonight. This series, Organizing for Change, centers the lived experience of community organizers and artists that organize and draws upon powerful histories and practices of people-led community organizing. There's a number of different um, events in the series. There was a public lecture a few days ago, which is now online. There's two workshops to come. Um, and this talk tonight is going, to become, is going to be recorded and it will become an online presentation. So if you enjoy it or you find it useful or generative, please pass on the link to others. Um, and all the information uh, is or will be available on danceoutfoundation.com. So this is how tonight's discussion will be structured. Um, first, I'm going to give a brief overview and context for this conversation. Um, titled, um, so the title of this event is, we can read it in two ways. One could be how to hope and organize or how to not hope and disorganize. Then I'm gonna introduce the speakers. Um, then each of the guests will speak about their work or their practice for around 15 minutes each. Then we're gonna have a short break and stretch our legs and drink some water. This is gonna be about two minutes. So not quite enough time to make a cup of tea or um, what they call in Australia, a smoko, just just to let you know. Um, then there'll be a conversation um, between the three speakers and 
in the last 15 minutes, we will open up for questions and Joe Moran is going to join me in fielding these questions and we will present them to the panelists and they will respond. Um, I, I'm going to end my introduction with a little bit of Zoom housekeeping and protocols. So I'm just going to, um, yeah, great. Right. So uh, the theme of how not to hope and disorganize came about through Joe and my curatorial conversations. When early on, we talked about how we might offer our audiences and also ourselves tools, resources, and shared knowledge and information in a range of formats and modes. Um, so I'm just gonna check this message that says, hi, oh, okay, sorry, that's not for me. I'll just continue. Um, I just wanted to make sure because someone was saying that they, they can't hear the audio, but I trust, uh, I trust that the void that I'm speaking into, I can be heard. Um, so for all the events that um, Joe and I co-curated, we wanted to bring together people who um, filled the following criteria. They are brilliant, amazing, experienced, knowledgeable, generous, articulate, and informed. It was also really important for us to center black and global majority queer and or disabled practitioners. And I'm not going to read out the, bio, the biographies of the esteemed guests that we have brought tonight um, because they are listed on the website. And I imagine that you have already read them because that's why you're here. And also time is short and the world is burning and I'd like to stop talking and start listening. So what I will say is that it's an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to bring together sociologist Adam Elliott Cooper, whose research focuses on anti-racism and policing, curator Natasha Gimwala, who is um, zooming in from Colombo, Sri Lanka, and who curates incredible contemporary art and visual culture festivals across Asia and Europe. And performance and visual artist Quincy Gario, whose work centers on decolonial remembering, particularly on Dutch colonization of the Caribbean islands. You know, I have to admit that I'm feeling very hopeful right now. And um, just before we hand over, um, I want to say that if you're joining via Zoom, you can ask questions via the Q&A function. We're going to get to as many questions as possible. If you're experiencing any tech issues, and I think this has already been happening, then you can use the chat function and the tech team will do their best. Um, if you're joining via YouTube live stream, you can ask a question using the chat function on the right hand side of your screen. And like I said before, Joe's going to jump in with the questions because there's quite a lot to field. And um, um, so you'll hear from him then. Now, it's my absolute pleasure to hand over to Adam Elliott Cooper, who's going to begin um, the presentation, after which we'll hear from Natasha Gimwala, and then we'll hear from Quincy Gario um, on how to not hope and disorganize. Thank you so much, um, Amara, for that introduction. And thank you for everybody at Organising for Change for the invitation to take part in this really fascinating and I think quite unique event. I don't think I'd ever taken part in an event with such an interesting mix of um, sp uh, speakers and thinkers and practitioners. So thank you so much for organising it. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, today about um, the work I do in relation to anti-racism and policing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how I came into this kind of work. Um, a little bit about uh, the kind of practical um, work that is carried out by people doing the kind of work that I'm involved in, and then a little bit about our visions and hopes um, for the future. So I wasn't always um, necessarily interested in addressing questions of policing, but I think I must have come into it almost by accident um, uh, when I was involved in my previous kind of career, which was as a youth worker. Um, so I worked in a, a number of different youth clubs in an area of Nottingham in the East Midlands of England, as well as in London, um, in Hackney, in Northeast London. And 
while a lot of the work that we did was um, uh, educational, so we you know did basic maths and English and other kinds of um, uh, skills and um, uh, providing other kinds of uh, educational work, and we did a lot of uh, leisure activities, um, sports, music, sometimes dance, things like that. One of the other things myself and the other uh, youth workers are always really interested in was engaging the young people we are working with in social and political issues. Um, and it was always something quite difficult. It wasn't part of a prescribed curriculum. It wasn't something that they had to do in order to continue um, on the different kind of programs that we might have run for them, particularly young people who might have been um, uh, permanently expelled from school who came to a lot of our, our sessions or other young people who came for um, a, a kind of a Saturday school on, on, on the weekends. So it was often quite difficult to try and, to, just trying to get young people to voluntarily engage in these kinds of often more informal discussions. And while they might dismiss I, discussions of class um, as being not relevant um, to the kind of hopes that they might have had for their own futures, or they might dismiss questions of racism as being tired and, um, and irritating and boring. As soon as que the question of policing arose, something clicked. And a lot of the young people we worked with, the majority, the vast majority had experiences themselves or in their families or their friends or their communities of harassment or violence or neglect at the hands of the police. And it was through these um, experiences that they had themselves and the frustration and the anger um, that they um, felt in relation to these experiences that we could have wider conversations around class. Well, because we could say, okay, so the role of the police, one of the main roles of the police is to protect property. But whose property are they protecting? Are they protecting your property? Perhaps not. And if they're not protecting your property, whose property are they protecting? And it was from that that we could have wider conversations about class struggles in Britain and elsewhere. And of course, um, experiences of um, being stopped or searched or harassed um, uh, or arrested by the police also opened up questions um, of racism and anti-racism for many of the young people we, we worked with as well. And so I began getting interested in questions of policing, not necessarily because it was the most urgent issue facing black communities in Britain, although um, I, I think a strong argument could be made that, that it is, but it's not necessarily, but that isn't necessarily the case, but more because it is, it works so well as, a, as, a, as an avenue to having wider discussions of um, racism and class struggle more generally. And I think that, this is partly because it is something which is um, in the immediate reality of so many, particularly uh, young black people in Britain. So what does our politics look like? What does our practice look like? So I would say that very broadly speaking, there are probably three general areas in which the kind of the practice of uh, uh, black resistance to policing kind of manifests itself. One of them, um, which I guess continues on from the youth work, um, which I now kind of do on a more voluntary basis, um, is around political education. So it's around, so this involves um, going to uh, schools or uh, what we call further education colleges. So young people who are 16, 17, 18 years old um, or uh, youth clubs or the community centers uh, where, I, where we run projects either in, um, or workshops either on what we might call stop and search training so helping young people and, or anyone really um, to navigate what to do if uh, they're stopped and searched and questioned by the police, how to de-escalate um, a situation, try to get out of it as quickly and as safely as possible, or how if they wish and feel safe and confident, confident enough to do so, how they might want to challenge um, a, uh, a stop and search either in that particular moment or um, after, the, after the fact. And what's really interesting and important about these is that almost very consistently, these kinds of quite practical conversations lead to further discussions about the wider context of policing. So people ask these questions, people, once we've, got, we've kind of got down to the, the practicalities of what we can do in these kinds of situations, questions also arise, why do the police act this way? Why does this institution function in this way? Have they always been this way? 
And so while we, we're doing this very kind of practical work, helping people in, deal with issues that are in their immediate realities, it often leads to a form of political education which helps to better contextualise institutional racism and state racism, to better contextualise the histories of racism as well. And on the flip side, sometimes I go into a school or a college or something and I'm asked to do a, an educational session on the history of policing um, or the history of British policing, uh, both here on the British mainland where I'm currently situated, but of course the longer history of British policing exists across its vast empire, where it did most of its policing, of course, in the Caribbean, across the African continent, across um, South Asia and Southeast Asia and um, uh, Australasia and, and elsewhere. And through these conversations about the history of British policing and how racism has always played this fundamental role in British policing and we understand it in the context of empire, arise questions for practical solutions. What can we do today? And so it's from these kind of more broad political historical conversations that we see um, uh, questions arising um, for what action we can take. And so through these kinds of um, this kind of political education, we always have this unity, not unity, but we always have this uh, um, this uh, this bringing together of the practical and what we might call the conceptual or the theoretical right? or you know, ideas, which I think is really crucial. The second area that I, um, I do a lot of work in are kind of legal campaigns. For, um, so working with families of people who have been brutalised by the police um, or um, have lost a loved one at the hands of the state. And this can involve a whole range of different kinds of um, uh, forms of legal campaigning, um, whether it be inquiries or um, taking cases against the police, or, or, or trying to use and um, utilise the kinds of uh, institutions that currently exist to disrupt and challenge um, these forms of uh, state, racist state violence. And I think the third and possibly the, um, the most, perhaps the most well-known of, of the um, um, kind of approach of this kind of black resistance to British policing, I would say is protest. People I'm sure are fully aware that um, both in Britain and the United States, and many other countries as well, I would imagine, uh, 2020 saw some of the largest <clears throat> anti-racist protests in British history, in, in, in that nation's history, both British history and American history. And while for some people these huge mobilizations seem to come out of nowhere, particularly um, for uh, much of the mainstream press in Britain, this certainly wasn't the case. And there have been um, for decades, um, and certainly even in the, the last 10 years, I would say, a concerted effort to rebuild Britain's uh, anti-racist resistance to policing, sparked, um, I think I would say, by um, uh, the police killing of a young black man called Mark Duggan in 2011, um, which led to a community protest and eventually civil unrest across the country, but also a whole wave of um, uh, protest movements led by the families of people who have died at the hands of the states, including groups like the United Family and Friends campaign, which not only does annual marches um, uh, to commemorate those killed um, by the state, which is led by um, a, a series of um, a, a group of, of black mothers, but it also does smaller marches uh, in local areas across the country um, and helps to coordinate those as well, led by specific families of those who have um, lost loved ones at the hands of the police. And so it's this combination of political education, legal campaigns and protest, I would say that most of the practical work um, is done. But just to finish off, I just wanted to say a little bit, a very little, a small amount about our vision, because the police and prison system and the border systems um, that we experience across the world, we would argue in our movements are beyond reform. Arguing for diversity initiatives or um, police consultancy committees or um, uh, unconscious bias training isn't going to bring about the kinds of changes that we need um, to improve public safety, to reduce harm in our society. Our vision is an abolitionist vision and that abolitionist vision requires us to erode society's reliance on the police and prison system and empower community alternatives to improve public safety and reduce harm within our society. Support for our youth services and our mental health provision, investment in um, supports for people who use drugs in a harmful way, um, uh, investment in our trade unions, 
in good um, public housing services, um, uh, supports for survivors of domestic violence. All of these kinds of forms of community-led infrastructure can help to improve public safety while reducing society's reliance on the police and prison system and border regimes, which not only do little to improve public safety, but often almost always, in fact, bring more harm and violence to an already um, vulnerable and harmful context. And so it's through these, this kind of practical work that we also have this longer term vision to try to live in a world where we hope that one day prisons and police and border violence isn't simply anti-racist, it's obsolete. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Adam. That's so fascinating. Oh, really, really compelling stuff there. Um, and um, just, I worked for seven years in further education colleges in um, South London, actually. So, um, God, I wish I'd known you then. That's all I can say. Yeah. Um, Natasha, do you want to um, jump on and share with us your world? Um, hello everyone, uh, thank you uh, Adam and of course uh, all of the organizers um, at the foundation. Um, I'm going to request for my presentation to be shared and I'd like to talk to you today about um, two initiatives that um, I'm presently part of uh, and also try and connect with um, some of the kind of questions that have emerged also in relation to hope uh, amidst a rather dystopic time. And also um, thinking about the question of anarchy to start with. Um, it feels somewhat strange that um, anarchy is posed um, in opposition to organizing in many ways. And I've been thinking rather um, of this quote uh, by David Graeber, who says, most of all, anarchism is just a matter of having the courage to take the simple principles of common decency that we all live by and to follow them through to their logical conclusions. Odd though this may seem, in most important ways, you are probably already an anarchist. You just don't realize it. And um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have time to talk uh, further. So some of these are just prompts because I just felt like in discussion uh, with uh, two of uh, my uh, co-presenters today and Amara, just feel like we can rethink um, and re-energize meaning into some of these terminologies, especially the way we have inherited them. Um, and I really feel as a, as a cultural practitioner that um, in many senses, the, the um, role of creating an exhibition is also a way of reframing language and thought, but also social behavior. So it's a, it's a way in which the exhibition can be an instrument and a form of language in itself um, that involves all of the senses. So how do we, uh, again, empower and provide agency to one another as practitioners uh, through the model of exhibitions? That's something that I'm very interested in. And this also includes self-organizing. It's not only about larger scale institutions that receive uh, major funding from the state uh, and private entities. It goes far beyond that um, because I feel that you do not you know, wake up in the morning and kind of tell yourself, okay, today I am a curator for so-and-so entity. It's just something that you also carry with you with a sense of lightness, but also with a sense of responsibility. Um, at all times and you sort of also are therefore responding to the context where you are, where you, and, and, the, and the way that context um, also um, sometimes when you enter context in a, in a way that you are hosted also as a stranger 
um, and those contexts are not um, always easy um, as a cultural practitioner and, and as a curator, you're also uh, needing to create an atmosphere of hospitality for the artists that you work with. So that's a lot of the work is really preparatory. So preparing a ground um, in which other practitioners can accompany you and, um, and be part of, of a shared learning. Um, so uh, Amy, could you share the presentation? It, it somehow stopped. Yes. I'm going to talk to you about the Colombo Scope Festival, which is an interdisciplinary arts uh, platform in Sri Lanka. Um, without going too much into the history of the island, um, I'm sure most of you know that Sri Lanka has witnessed decades of civil war, um, and there is a huge uh, diaspora a community that has suffered uh, from this ethnic uh, conflict, but also at the same time, waves of forced uh, displacement and migration. Um, so the generation of artists that we work with, um, the younger lot um, and also the senior um, artists, they have deep experiences uh, from these past decades, but also a sense of hope of what can happen now. Um, and so, in a sense, we have a, a, a big role to play as cultural organizers for a nonprofit platform like this. Um, recently, also given the what were called uh, the Easter bombings that happened in Sri Lanka, that really shook once more the community and, and the relationships uh, between people coming from various um, religious backgrounds really shaken by these bombings that took place in different parts of the island. And we really felt as a festival that we need to work outside the capital city. So that was one of the, um, one of the actions that we felt is necessary. What does it mean as a festival to only be present within the urban capital? You know, so for us, it's, it, there is a sort of um, way of thinking about um, criticality from within the platform because we're a sort of loose ensemble of individuals who are working towards this together. And so we don't see our efforts um, as something that are complete and finished and need to project uh, a sort of success um, uh, in, in a kind of international art world bubble, but really also just what we need to do on constituency and those international artists who have been a uh, part of a very kind of solid um, network. So uh, we go next and the upcoming edition of the festival is called Language is Migrant. Um, and I wanted to share with you this quote, uh, which comes from the poet artist Cecilia Vicuña. Um, Language is Migrant is really borrowed from her. It is a poem manifesto that begins with these words. Um, and it is, it feels paradoxical to talk about movement at a time of, of, uh, of stasis, like we are experiencing now, but at the same time, the way that language moves from mouth to mouth, the way that histories move um, as embodied spaces, um, the fact that diaspora voices and ways of belonging need to be at the center of our thinking, especially also when we're looking at um, the key questions of migration, of displacement, but also of the ways um, that language renews relationality. These are, and, and, and that takes me to Ocean Wong, another poet who says you are a participant in the future of language. So we're also interested in really, what are the ways to renew, to create bridges between forms of expression that are anti-systemic, that are also seen as um, beyond the, the framing of the language that the nation state allows you to voice yourself in, which is a big, big question in a place like Sri Lanka, because you are also um, targeted by the way that the voice uh, leaves your body, the way, that your the way that the voice appears from within a body. Um, next. 
So just to show you just some examples, I mean, of course, with the pandemic, it's been really hard for us to engage with international practitioners. Um, but one of the artists we're working with is Munira Al Sol, um, who has been really uh, focusing on um, stories of migration, um, multilingual ways of narration around biographies of people who have uh, been displaced or who have, um, who have refugeeness uh, written into their biographies. Um, and she's been working on these projects for quite a long time. Um, and one that we are working with her now on, um, it actually includes um, the translation of several words of love um, that are embroidered into different textile pieces. And so this act also of translation and translatability is something that we're uh, very committed to. So these words of love written in Arabic um, in the 13th century that were then translated uh, by the French Moroccan um, feminist, Fatima Maranisi, um, and then, and then are further translated into Tamil Sinhala and embroidered by a group uh, of collaborators who we have invited here. So what can really also happen without travel? What are the ways in which to foster alliances uh, with artists who are elsewhere while still us being here and um, being able to participate in an ongoing project such as this one? Um, next. One of our other initiatives uh, that, that started recently is A Thousand Channels, and it is with um, uh, Pakistani British uh, sound artist researcher Saima Tariq uh, leading the project. And we're borrowing from um, Edward Lisson's Poetics of Relation, where he, he, he notes one way ashore, a thousand channels. So thinking really how the radio is uh, a way in which to disseminate um, as, as one does between a body of water and, and tributaries. So these sort of uh, fluid networks that are cast in multi-directions through the, the role of independent radio. And we're obviously aware that there's so many such independent initiatives that are using the radio waves. And in fact, we have several guest radio stations that will also contribute from their program archive for this initiative. So really also thinking about the Indian Ocean as this site um, of water, the site of common belonging from which a thousand channels as a radio initiative will be uh, taking form and also thinking about the history of partition that has ruptured the land-based affinities in South Asia, how um, A Thousand Channels counters that by bringing in various South Asian um, diasporic um, and independent uh, practitioners. Okay, um, next. Also another project uh, to share with you is an ongoing project and you should uh, really check out this artist archive, Marinella Sanatore has been um, creating the School of Narrative Dance in various um, cities in the world. And it's a non-hierarchical uh, school, which again is more an ensemble of different um, individuals, uh, practitioners uh, who want to think through uh, somatic modes of togetherness, um, also learning really um, about the body in pain, the body in hope. Um, she has uh, been thinking with us also of how to transform this project um, into a, a collaboration here on the ground with Sri Lankan practitioners who we have been in touch with across the island. Um, and again, this is really also a way of uh, working uh, with communities um, who have been through trauma, communities uh, who are also suffering from uh, issues of addiction, and to use the body to, uh, to create even small moments and instances of liberation. Um, so there's a lot of information on this project that I welcome you uh, to, uh, to view. Also, it feels like for just this kind of gathering of individuals, it feels like this could be a great example to draw from. Um, next. And maybe just in closing, just to take you through a completely different uh, project 
which is the 13th Gwangju Biennale in South Korea. It's the oldest uh, contemporary art uh, biennale platform. And uh, in Minds Rising Spirits Tuning, which we've been working, for, working on for the last two years, we've been thinking about how to center aspects of intelligence um, without uh, this dichotomy of um, the computational, the corporeal and the spiritual, how these actually oper these forms of intelligence operate together. Um, the fact of the organic and inorganic modes of intelligence and of the mind, um, because the history of the mind, as we know, has been overwritten by Western technoscience. And so really thinking about the questions of intelligence that, that come from um, queer survival, that come from indigenous cosmologies, that come from uh, different fields of sovereignty and the current modes of resistance building. Given as well, um, and we can go next, Guangzhou is a place where there has been an important history of uprising, uh, which in fact, um, May 18, 1980, was the date of um, the civic uprising in Guangzhou, a pro-democratization movement that really shaped the city in many ways. And so we've been thinking about how, um, as Adam was saying as well, the current modes of resistance building and citizen movements can also um, be ways to kind of look at them as forms of, um, of knowledge that can be shared across the hemispheres. So we gathered a group of activists, journalists, scholars who are part of movements uh, currently uh, really drawing from, from the 1980s until today, because a lot of this, the kind of movements from the 1980s are, are, are kind of repeating today, including some of the policing operations that started back then. Um, this is just another view of a project uh, really thinking a lot about artistic pedagogical models. That's another, uh, which you see also in Marinella's project that I showed before. This is one by Admin Oliti, an Argentinian artist um, who has started an ongoing project called the Feminist School of Painting. So how do we also liberate um, the burdens of art history um, and the patriarchal burdens of art history at that uh, by engaging in a project such as this, which took place in the Biennale with several workshops. So also the exhibition as a site of learning and undoing um, the, the hierarchies of learning. Next. Um, I think we may not have time for this. Um, can we go next? Okay, I just uh, wanted to end with two, uh, two elements. Um, Given that the pandemic um, levels was um, rather low when we were working in South Korea, we were able to conduct um, a procession uh, which took place within the exhibition. So this again was about structuring and centering performativity within the Biennale itself. So the Biennale becomes a sort of um, a live, uh, not a, like not a backdrop, but really a live set for the performance, the pro a procession to unfold. And for this, we worked with a duo called 8 OS, um, who work also with um, systems of resilience, vulnerability, and confluence, ways in which movement um, and brain activity is mapped and, and responses are generated between uh, a set of dancers and musicians inside the exhibition. So I'm going to show you a brief clip of this and then we close. The sound isn't working. There's still no sound. Okay, sorry, I don't know if you all hear the sound, I don't, but um, we'll maybe have a chance to, um, I'll send you a link so that you can watch it later with sound. Um, 
but this is just some of the clips um, that have that include the procession that has taken place. It's a bit sad without sound, but no worries. Um, okay, um, and to close again, this is more a prompt and maybe something we can discuss uh, later on. Um, I've been revisiting um, this idea presented by Leela Gandhi on uninjurability. Um, and it's, it's, it feels rather strange to talk about it right now, also in terms of the sort of deep state violence that is emerging um, in so many parts of the world, um, including, of course, Palestine. Um, what is this question of um, how does an injurious society, um, where does it take root from? And what, what does this uh, notion, not of talking about nonviolence in a simplistic sense, but really the way she promised um, to really think about uninjurability. That's something that I'm um, really uh, also uh, invested to learn and think more about. So just let you read this and then perhaps um, close. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks so much for, um, uh, I, I don't know, every time I, I hear you speak or we talk or, or I listen to things you've written or read things you've written and listen to things you've said, I just feel so inspired by the depth of, both the depth and the breadth of how you're working. So, and, and unendurability is a great, I think, connector to some of the things that Adam was talking about as well. So perhaps we can, we can return to that. Thanks so much. Quincy, look, you're all ready to go. That's great. Yeah. Um, I, I want to, I want to thank you for the invitation to be part of this. And, um, and it's amazing also to be in a panel together with Adam and together with Natasha years ago. Adam came to Amsterdam for an event which I, um, which I hosted. So I was a moderator for, and and I've known Natasha as well um, from different, different stuff. And last uh, I, I I saw her at um, at Savvy Contemporary in Berlin. So that was that was pretty cool. Um, I think I think when talking about my practice, um, I'm a little bit of. A, of a troublemaker. <laughs> I, I like to poke the bear sometimes. Um, and I want to start out with a, with a video first. Um, I, I just um, shared it with, uh, with Joe. So maybe we can, we can pull up that video. And it's a video of a work that I'm working on now. Um, and um, it's a video which is looking at, it's going to be shown uh, for an exhibition that's opening on Friday. So this is actually a really rough, rough cut. Um, and it's made by, um, it's filmed by Shivaros uh, de Schrijver and uh, for an exhibition curated by Valeria del Bagliville um, for the Institute for, of Things to Come. And, and this is a really sneak peek. Um, and uh, Joe, you can, you can start it. I think when sharing the video though, um, you have to click on sharing audio as well uh, on Zoom. So maybe pause. Oh. So in the, in the Zoom, Zoom settings, so when you share the screen, there's at the bottom a little thing that says share, share audio, I think, if I'm not mistaken.
Ah, it, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to want to do it. Okay. Don't worry. Um, what you're seeing now are two different videos. One is a 60 millimeter film shot in 1947 by the Dutch Government Information Service. And the other is a video that I shot in 2019 together with my mom. And what I'm doing in the performance is I'm talking about the information that was left out in the 1947 video. And I do that through the 2019 video because we retraced the literal steps of the film crew of 1947. And so when thinking about decolonial remembering, um, which is something that I tried to do, it is about asking those questions about what exactly does it mean to remember the past differently? And if we remember the past differently, what type of actions would they then uh, instruct us to do now? Um, and so when thinking about those types of questions, um, recently I got involved with uh, the political party uh, by AIM. Uh, thanks for sharing, Joe. Um, you, you could stop the video now and you could put on the second video. Um, and what for me was important when thinking about uh, politics and representational politics was exactly this understanding of hope, right? Or, or hopelessness. Um, the, the deep cynicism that a lot of us have, or let me say a lot of the people that I know within the circles that I move towards politicians and towards the idea that liberation is not something which will be achieved through representational politics, right? And what I think is important is that um, when thinking through um, politics, we need to be able to we need to be able to disconnect politics from the political. And we need to be able to think through what it means to be political and what it means to engage with the political as artists, as um, voters, as citizens, but simply also as people, because a lot of us can't vote in the places where we live, which I think is something that some of us also forget when thinking about politics as the place for liberation. Um, and so I saw this party, which was um, which was established in 2016, December of 2016, and it was called Bai Ain. Um, in English, that means together, which which is a. Uh, um, you know what you, you can put the sound up. Maybe, maybe after this, we also show the video uh, by Natasha um, again as well. Um, and so what you just saw was um, the band Conniption Fit. And um, the reason what I, wanted to, what I wanted to start off with the video is because of what they're singing and the context in which they're singing it in. Um, as a small political party, which is fighting for intersectional politics, decolonial intersectional politics, one of the things that we realized pretty soon after that during the last um, elections was that we were not getting invited for talk shows as much as the other parties. 
And there's something which is really fascinating about the ways in which um, silencing structures happen based on ideas of what is relevant for people to see or not. And within a Dutch political landscape, which is slowly sliding more into extreme right territory, um, which is normalizing fascism and, and anti-Semitism on, on the highest level, um, you get this understanding of like, you know what, let's not hope for the existing structures of media to tell us or to give us a chance. So let's do it ourselves. Um, together with the curator here at Chan, uh, creative producer uh, Rachel Walker and Astrid Ferenga, um, we decided to come up with uh, a talk show and we gathered and collected a whole host of people to join us. Uh, Esan Farjania, uh, Bob Schol, Celia Hulspas, uh, uh, Naomi Kombrink, uh, Julius Kusir, um, and a, a co host, um, Olympia Lotoparesa. And we decided what would what would a talk show look like if it was made by not just any political party, but what would a talk show look like if it was made by artists talking about the things that they would want to see um, on TV. And the conversations were different than what you would normally get on TV, on Dutch TV in any case, because Dutch TV is a bit obsessed with balance. And so what they mean with balance is they put um, what they think is extreme left what we think is normal next to extreme right and racist and then they would have to duke it out together on stage right we wanted completely the opposite of that we wanted to use and, and think through what does it mean to talk about the things which are important in a communal setting so how do we transform that moment of tv watching from the individualized experience that it has become into once again a community activity and how do we speak to an audience which hasn't been um which hasn't been told what to think or which is pitting from a different type of well right and so we made this talk show and then we showed it on rtv7 which has a reach of about 1.6 million people um in the netherlands but it's mainly geared towards uh, a caribbean and a, a south american audience so there's also something there in engaging an audience which is not necessarily seen as a politically active or engaged audience in the first place. Um, I don't want to talk too long, but I think for me it was about thinking through the ways in which, for example, also um, Professor Yarimar Bonilla in one of her recent talks um, about Caribbean resistance, um, and, and she was specifically talking about the context of Puerto Rico, the ways in which the idea of a future um, which has been fought for has been let go by the current generation and the ways in which the idea of a modern future or the ways in which in modernity this this idea of a future we can which can exist and which we are fighting for has been let go and now we're talking about a future foreclosed and so how do you deal with the fact that the promises of a future will never come to pass. So what's the type of future that you then want to make? And so the future that we wanted to make was this talk show in which we could express um, the views which we thought were important and in a way which had humor, which had a bit of spice and which had different various clues on it. So I'm also gonna share the YouTube um, account where the episodes are on. We made four episodes. They're all in Dutch, however, but we're still working on English translations uh, for those who would want to see. Thank you. Quincy, thank you. Um, yeah, very excited to see and to um, get a glimpse. I feel like we've just scratched the surface of your earth um, and look forward to, to digging a little bit deeper with all of our guests um, when we um, when we come back after a break and I think it's a really fantastic idea to start with Natasha's video as well if we can get the sound working on that I think that's great and you've just posted the link on chat is that the YouTube yeah it's thanks YouTube. thanks yeah. yeah that's great thanks for that yeah. And so the, um, the episodes are in Dutch, but the end part are the songs, and those are all in English um, with subtitling, so people can 
skip until the end and you get a bit of a glimpse of what we were trying to go for. Yeah, fantastic. Lovely to have song. Thank you for bringing that in. Um, let's take a two minute break. Um, it, it's it's 8.30 p.m. where I am. Um, I'll be back at 8.32. See you then. See you then. Okay, hi. Um, so maybe I'll ask Natasha and Adam to also um, put on their videos and unmute themselves. We had this. We had the suggestion um, of of having a look at that video with the sound. Um, uh, perhaps th that would be a good that would be a good beginning, and maybe Dance Art Foundation would be happy to share their screen and do that. Yep. It's
Yeah, so it's like a lot of percussive, what feels like cacophony, <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it was really powerful in the space to sort of create this sort of dynamic layers of energy. Um, also just given this moment we're in that it, this, this um, Korean um, drummers, they also sang a mourning song. So there was mourning, there was the way that Adam was just talking about this kind of escalation of tension between bodies. So also AOS really works with that methodology of what does it mean to protect the body from violence, but also contain and deescalate. And, and so, but it's, it's in a form of choreography. Um, so yeah, there were just a lot of different things happening, but we really did uh, use the exhibition space um, as a perf like a kind of a common site of performance for very different practices to dwell uh, and be together. Amazing. And then what was it? Can I ask a, a question? So there were also scenes outside. What? Yeah, that was also just right outside uh, the main venue. So they were moving inside and outside the uh, building that is made specifically for this uh, exhibition. Yeah. Um, well, that seems like a fantastic um, entry point into a conversation. I just, a, a few things that I'd like to say about the conversation is that um, I, I, this conversation is doesn't have an agenda. Um, it, 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 it doesn't have to uh, necessarily even do anything, I think. Um, but it will, of course, because you are all doing things. Um, but just, just to ease the kind of pressure, um, if, if you're feeling anything of that sort. Um, I, I don't really, this is not a Q&A, so it's not me asking questions or, or acting as a kind of conduit. I'm here, I'm listening. If I have something to say, I'll say it. Maybe if we have nothing to say, we don't say. <laughs> we can also sit in the awkward space of Zoom uh, until we need or want to speak. But um, the invitation is that, especially the three of you, um, talk to each other and that the audience that's watching and still with us can ask questions through the Q&A function in Zoom or the chat function on YouTube. And we will um, we'll let you have a conversation for a while and then we'll bring in some questions. And Perhaps apart from what's already been said, another um, beginning or point of entry is, I wonder what caught your interest in each other's processes and work um, or what you're curious or resistant about. Um, I'm, if I might, I might um, go first if that's okay, because there was something really, I think, fascinating and quite glaring that I'm sure a lot of our viewers saw about both Quincy and Natasha's presentations, right? Which I thought was fascinating, which is the fact that you've clearly taken very, very, very politically, in some ways, very different approaches to the projects that you're, you're engaging in. Quincy, you're taking this approach of setting up a political party, whereas Natasha is taking the approach of anarchism. Right? And on, the, on a surface level, these can seem as poles apart, but clearly, you have very, very similar political visions, right? You have, you have very similar kind of political um, uh, goals or social, cultural goals in the work that um, you're engaged in, despite the fact that um, yeah, one approach is, take, is, is uh, seeking to strategically, I would, I would presume, utilize um, the mechanisms of the state apparatus, whereas Natasha is seeking to completely circumvent um, and I was wondering if you could maybe both talk a little bit about not the differences because they are quite clear, but the but the way in which those differences can be ameliorated um, by um, I think a shared political vision, um, which take clearly quite different roads in attempting to um, reach those reach that that vision or those goals. Quincy, do you want to go first? Okay, um, I thought you'd go first. Okay, I can. Um, yeah, I guess first I should, I just, just mention, I just wanted to preface the fact that um, it wouldn't be entirely correct 
to for for me to also accept this position of um, an anarchist curator um, purely because, like I said, I think I'm I'm still trying to understand also where these limits are between forms of organizing and modes of anarchy. And I actually don't, don't think that, the, I think what we've been taught about this realm of anarchist action is in fact just um, weighs very heavily against uh, productive forms of engaging with the cultural sphere, especially. I mean, there is, we are in a point where cultural institutions, um, especially because I'm working within cultural institutions in Europe, this biennial is in South Korea, where there's also mega neoliberal patriarchal ways uh, of work, even though, you know, it is this part of Asia that for those who don't know enough about it, they, they kind of, it, one can gloss over those aspects. But um, there was, uh, there was this, uh, this tension really of you know what does it mean to to work in 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 that sort sort of environment in South Korea where there's there is major state funding the mayor of the city attends the event you know the city itself wants to profile itself as be, having borne witness to this particular uprising but through that, the uprising and the, the kind of uh, martyrdom, which is often male martyrdom, is sort of celebrated, you know, it, and, and, and those who are of other genders, uh, other abilities are not necessarily, you know, taken into this, this history of also um, this uprising or this cultural event that tries to commemorate that history. So I think for us, actually, it was, yeah, it, you're right. I mean, when you talk about the kind of challenging from the inside, it was actually about, um, and I think that's where perhaps, you no, know, I, I, I feel there's an affinity with Quincy of just um, extending the, the, the field of participation and engagement um, in a way that you're stretching. And, and, and it's this kind of it's this kind of deep stretching action where only like days later, the institution also realizes like the aches and pains, like, oh, oh my God, okay, that was too much stretching. But you're doing it in a way to um, also create space for different generations to act out their struggle, their exclusion, but also not not by you know only standing outside the gates but really and that's also why this idea of a procession because it's 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 an unfolding that's unpredictable so you know i think just to just to sort of leave it at that um yeah yeah i mean i mean the, the thing for me as well is having to think about the procession i immediately also think about claudia jones and i immediately also think about the ways in which to get a certain type of political liberation after she was, you know, deported from the US, ended up in London. Um, she saw the carnival and she saw culture as a way of political organizing and as a way of bringing people together to fight the systems in which they're in, right? And so for me, um, it was an interesting position to be within a political party. Um, because four years ago, I actually made a theater performance piece in which I simulated making my own political party, right? And um, even before that, in 2012, I made a performance piece in which I simulated um, an election evening and people winning. So it, it seemed kind of like another step in the circle of thinking through my connection to politics and understanding the ways in which on the one hand you can turn your back to politics, but politics itself will never turn its back to you, right? We'll always be within this structure that is pushing and pulling at us. So how can we push and pull back? And I think what was fascinating to do it within a party, um, which I didn't establish, I think I'm not, that needs to be clear, I, I joined, um, is that the party itself at times didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> right because we've been taught how a political party should function what it does what it can't and cannot do um we've been taught the limits of what a political party can do and i come in and i have a kind of anarchist creative spirit 
which is questioning all of these limits and all of these, you know, borders. And um, it's a question of quickness and agility and flexibility and working together with a group um, which is larger than you can remember all the names of everybody who's involved might not be as agile and as flexible as you want, right? And there might be systems in place, systems of care in place, which also prohibit quick movements because if you move too quick, not everyone will be able to come along. And it's constantly about that negotiation of how quick can you move and who can come along and who will need to give you space to move ahead or move sideways or move backwards as the group keeps moving. And I think what happened um, when, when thinking to the talk show and when thinking to my position as number two on the list of the party, so we got one seat during the last elections. If we got two seats, I would not have been able to show you the video that I started off the presentation with, because I would probably right now be reading dossiers about some law being made or something, right? But now I'm here. So there's also this, this interesting interplay of um, being at the cusp of, right? Always becoming, but not quite being. And I think for me, that was a, the, the fun position to be in. And, and when thinking about, you know, um, the way in which art can do that, um, in these settings, which are not conducive to that type of thinking, we get that same thing. And I think when thinking about your work and when thinking about police abolition, Adam, I have this same feeling. It's always on the cusp of, right? Who will, who will actually enact this abolition? Who, who will do that? Um, maybe you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, I think, and I think, again, this maybe speaks to... Um, uh, this uh, strategic, um, maybe even quite difficult relationship between this, what we might call an anarchic vision, right, where these state institutions uh, um, have been dismantled, but the avenues that we take to get there, the road to get there, often requires or utilizes certain forms of kind of mainstream policy making, because while abolition is the vision, right? We, we want to get to a world in which we no longer, where which society no longer relies on um, a, a border regime and a prison system in order to um, uh, improve and maintain public safety. The way in which we get there is so often through piecemeal reform, which requires um, engaging with mainstream um, parliamentary politics or representative politics. So it will be arguing that we need to reduce the amount of funding for um, uh, police weapons, or we need to reduce certain police operations, or we need to take police out of our school systems, or prevent um, police officers from interrogating um, medical professionals um, who, are, who are providing health care for people who have suspicious injuries and therefore might be associated with gang violence. Right? Um, all of these different types of uh, forms of uh, eroding police and prison power requires an engagement with mainstream political parties, despite the fact that our ultimate vision is the dismantling of the very same institutions which are helping to get to us to that, um, uh, that long term vision. So while so I guess the kind of what we might call abolitionist reforms. So some reforms of the police and prison system help to empower the police and prison system, um, like diversity initiatives, which you know put a few black faces in high places, um, or uh, um, uh, training, which can uh, and education. Um, so uh, you know things like unconscious bias training and other kinds of uh, trainings, um, which help to legitimise um, the police and prison system. But what we really want to do, of course, are what we might call abolitionist reforms. So reforms which erode police and prison power, take away their resources and re-empower and better empower community-led alternatives to improving public safety. And so these things all necessarily, therefore, require a, um, a, an engagement with existing uh, systems um, and structures of, of state power effectively. And so there is this, I think there is this interesting, we could necessarily, we could call it a contradiction, but I guess I would more call it a, um, a kind of strategic use of existing structures of power um, in order to um, slowly 
get us towards this world in which prisons and police are obsolete rather than that i think some people uh, rather than um attempting to immediately um uh hope that immediately in a, in a, with a click of a finger we can get rid of all of these systems of power we have to develop the infrastructure to to ensure there are alternative avenues of developing and ensuring safety and harm reduction within our communities um, before we can um, do away with these um, uh, these systems of, 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 of domination which are the current failing um, uh, uh, attempts by state powers to to provide public safety um, so I guess that also maybe yes as I said speaks to this this, these, these two purportedly different approaches. Um, I wanted to ask, I think both of you, um, the other thing I think is quite interesting that I picked up on, I guess maybe it's a, again, more of a kind of political question than a kind of, um, than a kind of cultural one. But I think it's also about this rise of authoritarian nationalism, um, which I know you mentioned Quincy is becoming a problem in in the Netherlands, but of course is a problem in huge parts of the world where we think of whether we think about uh, Modi in India or we think about Bolsonaro or um, uh, uh, nationalisms here in Britain, of course, and, and elsewhere. Um, and the extent to which setting up a political party or having an anarchist um, uh, an, or a more anarchist approach to politics is more about disrupting this um, business as usual kind of um, uh, nationalist politics, which is becoming more and more the norm, I think, in many parts of the world. Um, because I assume that the goal isn't necessarily to be elected into power um, and more about a disruption, or maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Natasha? But I feel, Quincy, this last point is is good for you to uh, maybe uh, is it is the goal disruption or is it about arriving to a form of power i think that's something uh, it would be good to hear from you on it's both mm. yeah and i think i think that, that there is the tension as well right so the the idea of the strategic um utilization of these systems versus the attempt to dismantle them and the thing is um this constant tension and 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 not not actually articulating it or not understanding that tension can lead to um also actions which can't be intelligible and i think for me there's also this this and you mentioned Glisha and Natasha, is this sense of opacity, like for whom should we be intelligible, when and what we're doing? And I think for me, um, in terms of the project of the talk show, it was in the one sense to be intelligible to this audience of 1.6 million, which is interested in issues from South America and the Caribbean, but then to also be unintelligible to the rest who might not quite understand why we chose that specific TV station, or why we chose the um, the music, or the way in which it was filmed, or the locations, or the ways in which our horizontal decision making within the group um, also led to different types of practices of of um, creative or, or, or creative practices. Um, and I think I also need to mention a couple of people that I forgot to mention just now. And you know, look, Annelus Bakker. Who, who did the subtitling, uh, Hayden Hook, who did the sound um, recording, Timothy Ahrens, who did the makeup, um, April Kane, who, who made like the, 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 the graphics. And so there's, there's something going on when a group comes together and realizes, you know what, we don't actually make talk shows. That's not our day job. <laughs> We're not really interested in the talk show um landscape in the netherlands because it's all pretty much just yucky repetitions or, or people selling something or um uh, an anchoring of the violent norm that we have in terms of discourse so what do we do with this format and how do we um dismantle it and and assemble something new with the pieces that we have 
And I think for me is there where this tension comes again, because you're making another talk show. And yet at the same time, it's not quite a talk show when you watch it. Um, and so the, the tension as well between um, wanting to be part of politics and needing to be part of politics because your life itself is already the subject of politics. I think there is where it, it comes about also, you know, seizing the, the modes of production and thinking through um, what that means literally. So if we're not being invited to talk shows, and I'm just using the talk show as, a, as, a, as an example, if we're not being invited to talk shows, what happens when we make our own? Uh, and what happens when we think beyond the function and the format of the talk show within the current landscape? What if it can do something else, something otherwise? Um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm just also rather feeling extremely, um, kind of fearful of what the everyday impact on our cultural work is also in terms of what has been accumulating, especially in the last, you know, few years where it feels like, I don't know, but I mean, I'm, I'm just talking very um, subjectively at this point, like where say I moved um, from India to the Netherlands in 2010 um, and already at that point, um, it felt like institutions, cultural institutions, um, but also different, like just in terms of like generally living in this city of Amsterdam that kind of calls itself, you know, it's like such an international city, et cetera. Um, but just, I just felt like there was, there were just a lot of doors that were kind of closed, um, even though they seem like glass doors, you know, that that pretended to revolve and, you know, open when you, you needed to access. But it, it felt like stifling environment um, in many ways as, as, as a person of color, you know, working in the cultural field. Um, and now, you know, and then, and then things so sort of slowly, you know, began to change, but also because of the everyday work that a lot of us are, are doing and have put in. And then, and then of course, there's this kind of counter mechanism and pressure that comes from the aggression of, uh, of an authoritarian nationalist um, state uh, entities. So it's also plural, right? It's not only the one uh, leader. Like for instance, you know, people are always talking about Modi. Um, but I'm also just starting to think much more. I mean, a, a lot of us about uh, the role of the media, no, um, and the role of certain corporates, you know, that that have been supporting this person's uh, kind of power uh, so so fully, so blatantly. Um, so there just feels like these this kind of current, in a way, of a certain kind of shift that has been registered within the cultural domain. And it is not also about this kind of neutrality, this kind of field of neutrality that perhaps comes from, you know, a place like the Netherlands, also the UK of like representation at, at face value, but really trying to open up uh, to what is at the core of institutions and what is at the core of institutional practice. Um, and there have been certain changes, um, certain modifications, let's say. But, but alongside that now is this kind of extreme pressure, right? Where, where you, Adam, also you know, would, would be needing to constantly stay in a, in a position of alertness towards the communities, to protect the communities that you're training and working with. So on one hand, it feels like, okay, there are more invitations and spaces in which to do one's work. And just that, like do one's work with a sense of purpose and a sense of um, of being able to invite different collaborators and get it get it for take it forward. But at the same time, there's there's a situation uh, of of just a whole lot of uh, tension and difficulty because that stems from the kind of leadership that we are placed under. Yeah. 
Yeah. It, it makes me think as well on um, when that tension bursts or needs a release. So I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, um, what was called the London riots, but I keep thinking of it like uprisings um, and the series of them and the ways in which when young people rise up against police brutality, it's depoliticized or it's seen as something beyond um, a political agenda. Um, maybe you could talk a bit about that, Adam. Um, uh, how exactly are these uprisings then, then how did they lead to, to changes? Because I mean, the Sewell report, that, that wasn't, <laughs> that, that was a bit odd, yeah. So I think there's, a, there's some interesting things happening here. So in 2011, a young black man called Mark Duggan was uh, shot dead by the police. And uh, the police, rather than going to Mark Duggan's family and telling them what had happened, uh, they spent most of their time writing uh, press releases and making sure they had their witness statements in order. Um, and the family found out that their loved one had been killed by the police when um, it was reported on the evening news um, because they were more interested in getting their story straight with the press than they were um, uh, treating his family with any kind of dignity. Um, and so we should be unsurprised, therefore, that when the community organised a a protest to the local police station to demand a conversation with a senior officer that they dismissed them and told them to go away. Um, and that's and it's at that point late in the night that um, a brick was phone, thrown through the window of a um, unaccompanied police car and what arose from there were four days of urban rebellions across cities, across first London, but then eventually the whole of England. I think one of the things that it sort of do was, I think something that speaks to um, something Natasha mentioned, which is this idea of London, like Amsterdam, um, portraying itself as being this um, uh, multicultural, liberal, um, inclusive, progressive uh, city. When in fact it is um, a city in which, um, uh, that, has, that has a police force that has led a, a prison system, which has almost doubled in the last, um, 20 or 30, in the last 30 years. Um, it is a, a city which has a police force which, has, um, which is incarcerating black people at the same rates that the United States incarcerates African Americans. Um, a huge expansion in police uh, power from surveillance and uh, militarization to, as I mentioned before, the expansion of policing into our schools, our healthcare systems, and, and other areas of public and social life. And one of the one of the really interesting ways in which we've seen this con this pushback against Britain pr presenting itself and London in particular is presenting itself as this place of multicultural inclusion and progress is partly through these urban rebellions, um, which of course commingle with um, uh, more forms of less spontaneous and more organised uh, protest and political action, but also crucially as well through culture. I would say. So a whole wave of um, uh, uh, musicians and other artists really, I think, did much better work articulating the politics of racism um, and resistance to policing in, in and around the uh, period of 2011 than uh, the kind of government reports which were um, uh, you know, generated almost mechanically um, in the years which followed, which went through the same boring kinds of uh, predictable um, uh, reform proposals, police consultancy committees, unconscious bias training, diversity initiatives, the same things which have failed over the past uh, 20 years and of course failed in the 10 years since uh, the rebellions of 2011. And the failure of those I think have led to two things which are really interesting. The, there have been a rejection of these kind of attempts at liberal reforms. And they've, those rejections have taken two kind of routes. One of them, as you mentioned, Quincy, was the Sewell Report, which for those who um, have the fortune of not knowing about, um, is a, uh, a report led by a group of conservative black and brown um, bureaucrats, um, uh, uh, which, has, which denies the existence of institutional racism in Britain and says that if there are um, racist outcomes within institutions, they can either be explained away by other factors or by the fact that actually um, the black and brown people who are, who are, who are um, uh, demonstrating uh, 
unequal outcomes in these institutions um, have these experiences because they have some kind of deficits culture or they have some kind of um, uh, family problems or other form, other kinds of deficits that exist within their psyches or in their cultures or within their um, their social lives. But the other rejection of these kinds of liberal reforms, of course, has been something far more radical. And rejection of these kinds of liberal reforms have come as I mentioned, through culture, as well as through kind of social and political organizing, where artists and musicians, as well as young people and activists and, and communities have all said, yes, we also reject these kinds of liberal reforms, but not because there's no institutional racism, but because institutional racism is being misinterpreted. And eradicating institutional racism isn't going to come about by providing better education or training or policies or practices. It's, by, it's going to come about by eroding the power of these racist institutions. It's by, going to come about by eradicating and dismantling these racist institutions. And I think opening up this possibility, I think has enabled the mask to drop from these kinds of, um, uh, the mask to slip from these uh, liberal multicultural cities, which like to portray themselves as, as uh, the, the, the model for progress. Instead, the gauntlet has been thrown down as to whether the right, the nationalist authoritarian right is going to say, we don't care about racism, it doesn't exist, and we're going to continue to expand the police and prison and border regimes um, in any way we see fit, or whether we're going to be able to defeat this, these authoritarian nationalisms with a leftist movement, which says we are not going to, we're not, we're not going to engage with these institutions anymore on these terms, and we're going to erode their power to the point in which they can no longer function because they will, they will never serve our interests and they can never do what um, they, they can never provide us with the safety and harm reduction which they purport to provide. Um, and so I think, I, I, so I think, yeah, there is. Um, uh, I think there, yeah, I think there are a number of interesting things happening um, uh, that came out of these two thousand eleven rebellions, and I think it's really crucial for us to re recall that because I think it helps us to, and this I guess speaks to your other points. It helps us to appreciate the p politics of those rebellions, because very often we think about Black Lives Matter and these other more formalized political formations as being the birth of um, the, 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 this militant um, anti-policing um, and abolitionist politics. But I, th I think that these movements were only made possible because of the more spontaneous rebellions um, of the young people that emerged from moments like 2011, which opened up the conversation about the failure of liberal reforms and the necessity for a different kind of approach and I think it's making these kinds of connections between the more recognizably organized um, and political and the seldom misdiagnosed as unpolitical or the too often diagnosed as unpolitical um, that I think we can make these really important connections, which I think are more often than not, not bridged by academics or commentators or activists, but more often I would say bridged by artists, by musicians, uh, by cultural creators. It's in these places that we see in art exhibitions or in the music studios or um, our music performances that we see people really articulating the crucial connections between the rebellions that are spontaneous young people are engaging with on the ground and the political visions um, for a different kind of future. I might just interject here to um, remind people that if they have any questions, um, I can't see any on the Zoom, um, function at the moment, but this is a good time to start asking um, some questions. Um, and because we're kind of heading towards a wrapping up, let's say, um, of this fascinating conversation, perhaps I could um, maybe, I mean, Natasha, you, you, you talked about self, or I think it was you that talked about self-organizing, might've been Quincy. Um, and then Quincy, you know, you started your presentation by saying you're a troublemaker. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Adam, you were using the word bridge and connector. And I'm just wondering about this term, you know, the title of this series is Organizing for Change. Um, we've been asking questions around organizing, but also disorganizing in terms of 
um, anarchic structures, but also in terms of actually systematic change, which is what we're all, you know, I think we're all trying in 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 various ways to 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 work to instigate systematic change, not just personal change. Um, uh, or, yeah, uh, and I just wonder a little bit, not so much. I guess my question is not so much can you give us strategies for organizing or disorganizing, but but you are all people that it seems to me organize and then also disorganize in not in just in terms of your doing, but in terms of your thinking. And what is what is the you know how do you live with that? <laughs> how do you live how do you live with that with that tension or or um, you know, I was listening to a talk actually, Quincy, that you a radio show um, where you talked about police brutality on your body, um, and then you know I'm coming up with uninjurability. I thought that was such a great term, particularly in terms of non-violence discourse that I've been quite familiar with, and and interested, Natasha, if you had anything to say about the difference between uninjurability and non-violence, and then Adam, I've been thinking a little bit about like the kind of I imagine. I mean, I'm I might be wrong, but I imagine from my experience of working in further education institutes that you're dealing mostly with young men. I mean, you might be working with young women as well, but it seems that police brutality, like it's really enacted on the male body. Um, and, and it's not to say that women um, and trans people don't uh, experience violence because, you know, hell we do. But I, I feel like the kind, when we see police brutality, um, and in my experience, it was the young men who... And so how do you speak about, do you speak about pain? Do you, do you speak about the pain body or do you speak about, um, uh, I don't know, softness or weakness with, with these boys and girls? Various random questions and thoughts from me. Um. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks. Those are really interesting questions, um, and I think that there's I think there's a number of things here that I think are really crucial. I think the first is that um, I, I would think about it less in regards to organising and disorganising, and more for me, I think about dismantling organisations and building different ones. So when we seek to um, disorganise policing right, uh, by disrupting the way in which it functions, right? whether it be through uh, challenging stop and searches or whether it be through um, trying to use the courts and legal um, system against the criminal justice system itself, um, whether, it be, whether it be through ways of um, empowering and up, uplifting the voices of incarcerated peoples, right, which um, our current system seeks to disenfranchise and silence. We're not simply trying to disorganise these systems of, 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 of control, domination, and, and disciplinary power. We're also at the same time built, crucially, trying to build alternatives to them. Because we can't simply dismantle the police and prison system without an alternative um, to that system, um, uh, uh, not to, well, in place or at least um, in process, right? So it's about developing our youth services so that young people have a safe place to stay, have somewhere um, where have trusted adults that they can confide in, um, have have institutions of of, of uh, companionship and family and, and society, um, which can better enable the kind of supports that's needed, um, which can reduce harm and violence. All these different things. So I, I would see I would see this kind of. The, this tension between organizing and disorganizing is more about a, a, a dismantling with the one hand and, and a building with the other. In relation to the question of gender, gender, I think there's some, oh, sorry, Quincy, did you want to come in? No, no, go, yeah. Um, uh, well, in, in relation to the question of gender, I think this is really crucial, right? Um, because while it is certainly young, particularly young uh, boys and young men, particularly black boys and young men, um, that, um, uh, that, that we, we work with on these kinds of workshops and programs and educational initiatives. Most of the um, legal campaigns and many of the kind of family-led protests are almost exclusively led by women, mainly black women. They will be the people who are um, the mothers 
or the um, partners or the sisters or other family or community members who um, have lost the people um, in their lives that they cared for. Um, um, and I think what this does is it does a different kind. It does a different kind of care work, right? It politicizes care work. It doesn't do the kind of normative, gendered care work that exists within the domestic sphere that's supposed to be confined to the home um, and do and um, confined to this um, uh, form of reproductive labour. What it does is it articulates care work as a form of political activism which seeks to not simply challenge normative ideas around where care takes place, but it also crucially is a form of care work which challenges state power, which challenges white supremacy, and therefore also challenges patriarchal norms about what care work is and what it should be confined to as well. And so think, I th thinking about gender through those kind, through that kind of, um, uh, those kinds of observations, I think is really crucial and I think a really crucial element of appreciating the gendered nature of not simply um, police and prison power but also the gendered nature of black resistance as well. Great answer. I was like wow, wow. Because um, I mean especially in, in that sense of like the intergenerational conversations that that sometimes um, that sometimes are lacking. One of the things that I realized. So the thanks for bringing up um, the the podcast. So in 2011, I was arrested by police, um, and it was pre pretty violent, and it got um, put on YouTube. And because it was put on YouTube is why I was eventually also released. And um, afterwards that the public prosecutors had to say that the arrest itself was illegal. And one of the most fascinating things about the video is that in the video, the, the woman who uploaded it spoke in Papiamento, which is a language which was developed on Kivasa or Ruben Bonaire, um, where, where I'm also from. And then she says she's going to upload it to YouTube so that they don't take it away, so that they don't erase it from her phone, right? Um, and there is a way in which memory, memory work around care um, is also part of these conversations that we're having. So when thinking about like political activism and care work as political activism, it's also about caring for the memories which sometimes we are told to forget and thinking about the interlinks and the linkages between conversations which might seem disparate, but which were happening at the same time. And so when I think about a figure um, like Claudia Jones, I'm, I'm also thinking about the conversations that might have been had or could have been had at the same time with people like Otto Heiswout, with the COM intern, with um, uh, Patrice Lumumba, right? It's around the same period. And so there's something going on in ways um, that we tend to remember the, the, the Frans van Ons and we tend to remember um, um, all of the male figures, but then the, the women, right? The, the non-binary people who were involved in those types of struggles are left out of the conversation because of the patriarchal need within activist structures as well and organizations to think and look at you know charming male figures so um great great point adam and i was thinking to myself as well this this way in which when i realized after my arrest that people were trying to look at me as a leader and i kept rejecting it um it had to do with the fact that i am a black caribbean man right and i have a certain deep voice and i laugh a certain way and people look at me and i'm like okay i'm it's, it's bizarre when you realize that about your own self and then start to think like, how do I break this down? And so one of the ways in which I started to think true is to um, figure out which were the communities which have been doing resistance work and how could I connect? And so initially I connected with um, the association, the society, our Suriname, Om Suriname, um, which was the place also where, where Adam together with Derek Purnell um, gave a talk. Um, and then from there on, I kept thinking about these communities and the ways in which the work has always been done, right? It might not be sexy, it might not be in a newspaper every single day, 
but there are people who show up and who do the work, which is creating community space, which is communal care, and which is thinking beyond the structures that we're told that we can operate in. And so one of the things for me, which was also interesting the last couple of years was to think beyond institutional critique and to think about institutional technique. And that's a term that I heard by um, Monica Shishwick, um, who's the director of the Apple. And um, it's been really interesting to, to think through what does that mean about the technique of institutionalization, right? And not necessarily rejecting institutions wholesale, but rejecting the violent ones that we've been taught to think of as indisposable. Like what happens when the institutions that we need and the institutions that we want um, are made by us beyond the paradigms that we've been taught to think about, like what institutions can do. Um, and so that's why, you know, thinking too as well, like the political party itself, the political party as an institute that we know is violent because it talks about care only for a specific type of group. What happens when a political party becomes a political party that talks about intersectional and decolonial um, activism, right? Because through the intersections of oppression, you're already creating a group beyond a specific target group or beyond a specific care group. You're talking about not necessarily identities, but you're talking about the politics of identifications and the ways in which those identity markers are then instrumentalized and, and um, weaponized against groups. And so um, it is thinking true, like what does that moment mean when you're arrested and what does the care mean that happens beyond your knowledge, which then leads to different types of outcomes. If that video was not uploaded to YouTube, I would not be sitting here. And that's a specific type of care, which I think is important to always remember and which I bring up constantly um, because of the way it has impacted my life. Um, and and I, I wanna also talk then to the notion of language itself, right? So there's a specific way in which the video was uploaded and then in a language which wasn't Dutch was used to upload it quickly so that no one around her could know what was going on. And that makes me think of um, the work by um, Jaha Ko, um, who is a, um, a Korean um, yeah, performance artist um, who studied at Das Theater in Amsterdam, who made a really wonderful, wonderful piece um, called uh, Lolling and Rolling. Um, and, and it specifically talks about the, the violence of colonial languages or occupational languages and needing to adhere to those. Um, so I, I was wondering maybe if, if Natasha could, could also talk about like the effect of the US and US imperialism um, and how that has a specific role in the, in the Guangzhou um, Biennale and, and how, how we can think through the resistance to those types of languages or to those types of ways of communicating in, in art practices? So um, I think we're, we're uh, rapidly running out of time. So I'm just gonna make um, two points. Uh, one, I wanted to actually circle back to a project um, that I did uh, called Riot's Low Cancellation of the Future. And this uh, slow cancellation of the future is sort of borrowed from Mark Fisher and Franco Berardi, Bifo, Franco Berardi, Bifo Berardi. Um, but also really thinking about this term of, of riot that is so contested um, and where again, the power hierarchies uh, play out in unpredictable ways. And there is a kind of fallout of this time of the riot that is again, so uh, elongated, so expansive, that is, it is very difficult to gauge um, what remains, um, what remains in bodies, what remains uh, from, uh, from, uh, from so-called destruction of capitalist economy, um, what happens with social housing, you know, how all of these aspects are disrupted uh, by the, even the question of the riot or as the riot is uttered, as the riot moves in, in and out of spaces. So um, I just wanted to kind of mention that um, as well. And, and, and there is this 
um, anthology, uh, which is uh, going to be released soon, um, called Riots Unbound, Knights of the Dispossessed, uh, which really looks at uh, the bottom up uh, riot and the top down riot. So also for me, coming from a context like uh, Gujarat, where there has been um, genocidal uh, modes of uh, what are termed riots, but then, you know, actually becoming um, ways in which the state oppresses through the mob and where uh, extreme political agents enter the mob um, and, and act out in public space, right? So um, just to, to share this with you and hopefully, I mean, it will be released soon and will hopefully be a resource um, to, to kind of deal with these questions um, of brutality um, and the, the ways in which bodies assemble and are forced to disassemble. Um, the, and lastly, you know, just, just to answer you very directly, uh, Quincy, um, yeah, we, we were really thinking a lot about this question of, um, of militarism that, that comes from uh, the, the United States um, into, into um, Korea, but also, in fact, with the artist um, C.N. Derrit, for instance, who is uh, from the Philippines, who's an artist um, and also with, a, with, an act, act, uh, with an activist network has been doing a lot of important work in the Philippines. He, um, he has actually created a project that uh, looks at the way in which um, American militarism has spread across parts of Asia. So Korea, the Philippines, um, and also through, throughout, he's also thinking um, about uh, the ways in which um, there is uh, the kind of question of valor, the question of, um, uh, again, like you were talking about, you know, male leadership, the way in which there is glorification of that image also of the American military apparatus um, and, and the bodies that, you know, claim these uh, as, so what are the kind of emblems, the, the symbolic um, role that actually also is carried forward and therefore it's a, it's a political and an aesthetic exercise at the same time, um, you know, to situate really this, uh, this, this spread um, of the American military apparatus. And also we worked uh, with a painter in Guangzhou um, who has been um, part of the Guangzhou uprising and also has been critiquing um, the dominance of the US in Korean politics for a long time to come. He's also been um, creating paintings that are also used as pro uh, pro uh, posters and protest sites, um, which we brought into the Biennale. Um, and also one such uh, painting, um, which depicts one of the Korean dictators, um, there was a threat to, you know, uh, or a request threat to, uh, you know, bring, bring down that painting um, while the Biennale was going on. But, you know, it, it there, so there's a lot of this kind of activity that 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 takes place. I think, and again, it's not about claiming and um, a, a work of protest as an artwork because in this case, it's it's always been both, and it's it's kind of inseparable, which um, is also perhaps you know something that uh, that one can draw from in relation to Quincy's work, where there are various rehearsals and tryouts that also have to do with political formation that then. Um, Later, later down the line, um, they 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 are realized um, in to in different stages, and so yeah, um, I think hopefully that answers. Thanks, Natasha. I think that's a really good place for us to. Um, I, I don't know if there is an ending, but maybe to stop, um, simply just to stop and continue um, in our own ways and yet together. I I mean I feel that you know Adam when you were talking about it's not it's not necessarily about organizing and disorganizing disorganizing but rather about dismantling I mean that that and also this whole conversation and your presentations I mean where, where it's got me to is just really affirming for me that perhaps it's not about hoping or not hoping but it's about generosity and um I just I just really feel that um 
you know, I just really want to thank you for your generosity in sharing your practices, in sharing your thinking, in sharing resources, and in sharing, um, but also your generosity, because I don't think generosity is just about endless giving. I think it's also about refusal, and it's also about standing up for and against and speaking, you know, speaking out. Um, and, and it seems to me in this conversation um, and in learning about what it is that you're doing, um, that, that it feels, you know, extremely generous um, and also your capacities for listening um, to each other. Um, so thank you so much, Adam Elliott Cooper, Natasha Ginwala and Quincy Gario. Um, I have a few thank yous, which is um, thanks also to our supporters, <laughs> the institution that is the Arts Council of England, um, and to my co-curator and dear friend, Jo Moran, and the excellent project management on the go by Amy Shepherd and Isabel Sachs. Jo and I would also really like to thank the people who got, I mean, we, we did co-curate this, but we had a lot of guidance and we reached out to ask for um, well, um, you uh, and others, and um, people who really supported us and were generous in, in sharing their networks um, for this project were Rebecca Wilson at the New Economic Foundation, Aisha Thomas-Smith and Esme Duggleby at New Economy Organizers, Efrosini Protopapa from the University of Roehampton, David Braniff at National Education Union, and Ian man board at equities. I hope I got all your names pronounced correctly. I can only pronounce Sri Lankan names correctly, just for the record. Um, full information of everything um, that you need to know um, is going to be available on the dance art um, foundation.com website. There's more events coming up. The workshops are sold out, um, but perhaps there's a waiting list. And um, thanks very much for being here. Um, thanks for listening to the audiences out there. Um, I am wishing you all, all the very best um, as you hope and not hope, as you organize and disorganize, as you dismantle and um, put together new structures um, really for care. Um, go well, stay safe and um, take good care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. You too. Thanks. Bye.